welcome to the Toad on Games podcast. I'm actually sticking to a schedule now. This will be bi-weekly, every other Wednesday. I'm going to put that right at the start so people know. It's bi-weekly now, not just whenever I feel like it. With us today, we have Tommy Refenes. Refenes? Is that how you say your Refenes. Refenes. My apologies. Yeah, you got to pronounce it the most white way possible. <laughs> like, That's okay. There's, there's no culture to it. Well, my surname's Brown. It's like the least interesting surname in the world. But people still misspell it anyway. <laughs> How do you misspell Brown? They put an E at the end. Ah, <sighs> people. I will say, like the colour, and that will confuse them even more, for some reason. Uh, you know what? This is too much. <laughs> it's, it's too much dealing with people. They can't spell Brown. I know. Yeah. yeah come on. What a mess. <laughs> uh, obviously, in case you do not know, Tommy here is... Um, are you, are you Team Meat now? You just are Team Meat. That's, yeah, me and, uh, let's see, Kyle Pulver, who's doing level design, an artist named Lala, who's doing art, uh, Timmy Chang, that's doing animation, and Ivan, and I can never say his last name, uh, who is doing supplemental animation. But yeah, that's, that's Team Meat. Brilliant. Last names are a mess, we should just get rid of them. I know, let's, you know, let's just all use our Twitter handles. I'm at Toad's Anime Brown. Yeah, mine's Tommy Refnus, so I guess I kind of screws that up. <laughs> Gosh dang. So today, obviously, we'll be talking about Super Meat Boy and Super Meat Boy Forever and some other bits and bobs. So I've not played it, but was your your first sort of commercial release was Hoop World? Was, is that right? Oh, I, I don't know if you could even count that as my first release because the version I worked on was, uh, it was going to be on Xbox 360. Mm. and um, they kind of screwed up their Xbox deal, and they kind of let almost everybody go, and then they redid Hoop World with somebody else, and it was on the Wii. So, yeah. If you didn't play it, uh, I don't think anybody else did either. Like, honestly, I think it kind of... Like, (laughs) all of the stuff that I put into it wasn't in the final game, because all of my stuff was Xbox code. Oh, I see. Yeah. (laughs) But... Indie games at that point were kind of not a big commercial thing still. Like, WiiWare was a big part of the beginning of that anyway. Yeah, sort of, yeah. Not to allow yourself to do a little bit of a humble brag. I've always considered it sort of World of Goo, Braid, and Super Meat Boy that did kind of kickstart that. I, I would add uh, Castle Crashers to that. Oh, too. yeah, yeah, and Castle Crashers, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was like the golden age of indie game enlightenment where companies were like oh hey these actually can make money and then everybody lost their mind and now there's a thousand games a week coming out on steam Mm. so Mm -hmm. you're you're welcome world (laughs) i'm responsible for minecraft (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah. minecraft was my fault and then i didn't i didn't even get my 80 million dollar house out of it (laughs) um i've been interested in uh the indie scene for a while before that so mm-hmm. I was um, on Tig Source and, uh, and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. At that point, indie games was almost exclusively just free games that people were making. So right. I just had those and really into them for years. And then indie games kind of was beginning to blow up. And I remember back then, if, a, if an indie game was like coming to a console, that was a big deal for me. That was like, wow, there's an indie game coming out. Yeah, that was it was a big it was a big to do and it was like, oh shit, this is actually coming to Xbox? Like I I this isn't just something I have to like s- with some sketchy install script that uh installs on on only my Mac or something like that. Yeah, when they were actually coming to consoles, it was like, oh wow, how did they do that? Yeah. It was like because you had no idea. <laughs> so which one was first? Was it World of Goo that was first? Or was it Castle Crashers? <sighs> I think, and I could be totally wrong, but I think it was, oh, hold on, let me let me try to remember, <laughs> because I think World of Goo was 2008, mm. right? And then Summer of Arcade was Braid and Castle Crashers, right. and I think they were all around the same time. Yeah, they were all really close. Yeah, I, I would say 2008 was the year when all that, that shit was happening. Yeah. I can't even remember when World of... Oh, you know what? Google will tell me. Google, yeah. Let's do some Googling. I'm going to ask Google right now. Yeah, October 13th, 2008. So then let's see Braid launch date, which I believe was before that. Mm. Yeah, Braid was August. Oh. 
one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, uh, it would be Castle Crashers, Braid, World of Goo, and then two years later was Meat Boy. Castle Cra- yeah, Castle Crashers is also 2008. So, yeah. The Golden Years. Yeah. 2008 to 2010, and then everything went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> So you began your sort of indie relationship with Microsoft then? Actually, uh, started it with Nintendo. Um, oh, right, okay. Yeah, Meat Boy was, like, Super Meat Boy was going to come out on only WiiWare. It was it was just going to be a WiiWare game in the very, very beginning. Yeah, I remember. Because at that time, Steam wasn't even, like, a thing. Mm. It was kind of a thing. That is over ten years old now, yeah. But it wasn't a big prominent thing. Yeah, it's when it's when Audio Surf came out. So yeah. Audio Surf was, ha, huh, February two thousand eight. Weird. Two thousand eight was the was the year, man. Yeah. And Meat Boy started like development. I think two thousand nine, like January two thousand nine, and it was just going to be WiiWare because it was going to be a short little simple game, and it was basically going to be exactly what the Flash game was, but it was going to run on on the Wii. Oh, was it going to be a literal port then? It wasn't going to be like a full literal port, but it was going to be the same scope as the Flash game. Like, right. No bosses, no real kind of cut scenes, a couple levels, you know. The the black bars on the side of the Meat Boy, because it was supposed to, like, the Meat Boy Flash game was a vertical uh, platform. I played it. I played it at the time. Yeah, yeah, and it was just, it was basically going to be that exact game, some new art, maybe a couple new levels, and that's it. Like, it was going to be a very, very quick game. Um, And yeah, it started out on Nintendo, and then, unfortunately, Nintendo had, I believe, a 40 meg limit, which, at the time, you were like, oh, it can maybe fit it in, but, like, if you look back on 40 megs, like, some websites are 40 megs. (laughs) Like, just to download all the images on a stupid website. So, yeah, that kind of killed that. And then, as that was being killed, Microsoft was being courted. Actually, Microsoft and PlayStation were being courted. And uh, Microsoft ended up winning out on that. And then Steam was also growing at that time, too. So it was like, well, it'll be Xbox and Steam. And then, ta-da, it became Xbox and Steam. And then eventually everything else. But, yeah. So you were expecting it to be quite a small affair then, really? Yeah, yeah. Well, in the very beginning, uh, because it was just going to be a little tiny Wii game, Mm. it was just going to be something that came out and then we'd move on to the next thing. Um, But as what happens in in development a lot of times is you start out with something and then you're like, well, we don't need the black bars. Oh, well, we can do chapters. Oh, we can do bosses. Oh, we can do this. And then it turns into a much bigger game. And uh, when we were showing it to Microsoft, it wasn't the little tiny Wii game. It was like, hey, we have bosses and this and that, and like we're we're going all out with this. And they were like, okay, <laughs> neat. <laughs> so, yeah, that was quite almost brave on their part. I know that you ended up having some problems with them. Yeah, we had we had some problems. I, it's looking back on it, it's a lot of stuff that could have been prevented with experience Mm. um we were just inexperienced with how we dealt with them and i think they were inexperienced with how they were dealing with independence too because it was still relatively new to them yeah the the first summer of arcade was 2008 and then 2009 was other things and then 2010 so it was it was pretty new for them still and they still like even when we were dealing with them they had doubts about meat boy like up until launch and that, that's where most of the problems came in because they thought, and I, it, this isn't to shit on any other game, but this is just basically what they thought. They thought that Comic Jumper was going to be the big hit for that little promotion. Okay. And when Comic Jumper came out and sort of flatlined, they were like, well, obviously nothing else is going to do well. And it's like, fuck, really? Right. <laughs> and we're sitting here and like... We even had like the the proof beforehand that Meat Boy was was going to do well because they showed it at PAX. Microsoft showed it at PAX, and people were resetting the dev kits, like the Comic Jumper dev kits and the Hydrophobia dev mm-hmm. kits. They were resetting those machines and uh, putting Meat Boy on them, and they had the lockdown machine, so they couldn't do that. Like that's that was that was our indication. That was our first indication that like oh, there was something there. 
Yeah, there's like we we knew like I I knew going into it I'm like this is a, this is a good game and I think this game is going to do well I didn't know how well but I was like this is you know this this has the chance to be something as big as Braid or Castle Crashers because it's like it's fun it's good it's well made it's it's just a good game and you know I didn't I didn't get that with the other games that I played in the promotion. Mm. Um, but yeah, like had had sort of indication that it was going to do well. Had no idea it was going to do as well as it did. So pretty pretty happy how that turned yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the the WiiWare thing mm-hmm. that fell through was that really because of space? Because the scope grew so much, it was just like it's not going to happen. That was there. There's there's two things to that, and I think I'm safe saying it now because he doesn't work there anymore. But. Um, <laughs> So the space thing was a huge issue because the game is not big, but the game is, I believe the Xbox, the first Xbox version, because we had to apply patch and there was like one pa- one or two patches that were applied, but I think it tops out at 120 megs. Right. And that's uh, with compressed audio and all this stuff. I made it as small as I could. Mm-hmm. And the only way we would have been able to do WiiWare is if we would have made it episodic. And to make it episodic would have been a huge engineering feat on my end. It would have been a lot of work, and at the time, WiiWare wasn't doing very well. So and our Nintendo guy, Dan Edelman, who doesn't work at Nintendo anymore, was kind of like, don't do it. <laughs> it's kind of like you know you could do it episodic you could do all this but like it's not going to be worth your time yeah so we kind of went with him and i know there was a lot of upset fans about it but honestly like 40 megs 40 megs is nothing and you look back on 40 megs now and you're like okay yeah that makes sense but at the time everybody's like just compress it mm. and it's like well i did <laughs> I, I couldn't compress it anymore. So. I mean, there's extra costs surely involved with separating it out into episodes anyway. And Yes, there was, there was development costs because we would have had to split the game into different content packs that we would have had to have each one of them go through certification. We would have had to test if some people got some episodes and not other episodes. Yeah. Like There was a whole thing to do, and at the end of the day... The game that did the best on WiiWare was World of Goo, and I don't think any other game did well on WiiWare. Not massive, yeah. Yeah, that was the one that Nintendo pushed, and they didn't push any other because, again, at the begin, like at that time, there wasn't a lot. Uh, the 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 indie experiment was still an experiment. You know, there was no, there were flukes. They thought of like, oh, this game did well, but this game didn't do well. You know, and they, they kind of saw World of Goo as like almost a fluke in a way, yeah. which it wasn't because it was just a good game that people enjoyed. But the high ups, the, the people that work with the spreadsheets and the numbers, not the people that are actually playing the games, are like, oh, that's weird. Mm. So they, they don't really follow up on it. Yeah, it would have been, for us, it would, have, it would have not been worth it at all. No. If it was a thing where like we would have gone, oh, okay, we'll do, we'll do WiiWare. I mean, it could have been a thing where we got into it and it just wouldn't have happened anyway. Then we would have wasted a whole bunch of time. So Yeah, it just wasn't worth the risk at that point. No, it wasn't worth the risk. It wasn't worth the time. And the audience wasn't big enough on WiiWare to do it. And unfortunate, and a lot of people hated me for it uh, because they thought I just should have compressed it more. But uh, that's, not how, that's, that's not how programming works. <laughs> that's how, unfortunately, a lot of gamers get it. They they don't view it in yeah. business terms anyway. They don't view the business terms of it as you are a person. <laughs> it's your time that you're spending, and it and yeah, it, it was money. yeah. They didn't view it as Tommy Refness has to do this. They viewed it as team meat, which they just assume is a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's just me. Um, and and to be fair, it's not a lot of gamers. It is yeah yeah. It is loud gamers. Yeah, absolutely. Like. Most gamers are like, oh, that sucks. And then they move on with their life because they're not fucking psychopaths <laughs> that are like sending death threats to people because their game's not going to be. Absolutely. <laughs> Isn't that the most amazing thing, though? Like when, when No Man's Sky or something was delayed and they started getting death threats. 
And it's like, well, how's that going to make the game faster if you kill them? <laughs> like, there's a disconnect there. It's amazing. Yeah, it's like a very outspoken minority, but that's the one you listen to. Yeah, unfortunately, that is that is the one that tends to have the most effect on people. That's why I don't read I don't read articles that are written about anything that I do. I don't read comments. I don't I don't even look at YouTube numbers for trailers that I put out. I am totally blind to all of it and I love it. That's probably quite a healthy way to It's it's good. Like the like I'll retweet some things and like uh, I'll I'll skim some articles. If I skim the article and I think it's good, I'll retweet it. Um, like I skimmed the I skimmed the article you did in the mirror. Yes. I'm like, oh, this is good. I'll retweet it. And then like the Eurogamer article and stuff like that. I, I skim those and sure. uh, or or somebody will send them to me and say, oh my god, did you read this? This is amazing. And then at that point, I'll be like, oh, okay, I'll I'll share that. But every other time, like I I haven't read. Any comments on uh, the trailer for Forever? I haven't read any like little reviews or anything like that. Nothing, and uh, it's pretty great because I just go forward uh, with the things that I can actually see, which is people playing the game, like at PAX mm-hmm. and EGX and stuff. I go forward with that, going, "Oh, okay, people like this." That's a good idea. And yeah, I, I, I I've I've stumbled onto something. I've I've beaten the internet. <laughs> It's a good idea because when you look at indie games like Rhyme, for example, which came out and most people enjoyed it, but Mm -hmm. there was, during the development process, um, something came out and, you know, gamers shat on it. And and it put the team in such a downer that they they were in tears. They they basically didn't want to finish the game at that point. They were like, this is going to bomb. And it didn't. It did fine and it was good. But it's just that if they had avoided that entirely, nothing would have been different anyway. Like, obviously, feedback's important, but it, it really yeah. was a fuss over nothing in the end. Yeah, it's a quality of life thing. The, we don't live in a world where you can put out something amazing and people won't shit on it. Um, like, take Cuphead, for instance. Mm. Um, I, I'm not going to play Cuphead because it, it looks like Contra, and I'm, I, I'm, like, super busy all the time, so I only, like, focus on games that I absolutely know that I'm going to love. Chill. Like. Uh, Mario Odyssey is coming up, uh, Red Dead Redemption, those kinds of things that I'm like, I absolutely 100% know that I'm going to enjoy. Um, but I look at Cuphead, and I'm like, this looks fucking amazing. Because it does. It looks incredible. And like the reception for most people is, oh, it's a really, really good game. It looks amazing, but it's really hard. And then, of course, people just gravitate to the hard then they just try to come up with reasons to shit on the game for its difficulty, like it's misleading or something like that. And I'm just like, shut up. <laughs> like, everyone shut up. God, it's, it's, it's an amazing looking game that's doing incredible and it's unique in how it looks. I mean, I don't know if it's unique in how it plays because I haven't played it, but it is definitely unique in how it's presented and how it looks. And it's extraordinary for that alone. And why not? Let's, let's find something to shit on about it. I suppose the argument about Cuphead, the reason you're probably so upset about it as well, is, is easily one that could have been applied to Super Meat Boy. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that happens that happened with Cuphead is it looks incredibly inviting mm. um, because it looks like this old-timey cartoon and it, it tricks you in that it looks so amazing that you just think it's going to be like, it's going to be this game that's just going to like just present you with all these things and it's going to be super amazing to play and all this stuff and I'm sure it is for people that enjoy really really hard shooter games like I didn't know it was a shooter game until like a week before it came out you assume it's a platformer I thought it was like a little adventure platformer Mm -hmm. because in my mind that's what fit that theme Yeah. but in the developer's mind they're like and I, I applaud them for this because it's amazing it's almost like they were like Okay, we want to make a hard shooter. Let's make it look like 1940 cartoon. Why? I don't know. Because we can. It will look awesome. And then that was it. I, it was such a great move from them because it really, like, obviously, it made them stand out. It, it got them the attention of Microsoft. Yeah. And Microsoft probably threw a shitload of money at them to keep it exclusive. And then I know they spent a lot on marketing. Mm. Uh, like, the, the Cuphead launch party had, like... Cuphead uh, cake pops. 
And those are expensive. Yeah, well, I mean, like, if you make one cuphead cake pop, that's fine. But if you make oh, some for a party, you know, that's easily a couple hundred bucks right there. And then that with, like, special colored Xboxes and everything. Like, Microsoft saw that this was, like, something unique that they could champion. And Absolutely. I hope that, uh, I don't remember the studios, the Studio HD... CHPR, whatever. something like that, yeah. Something like that. I hope they got a shitload of money out of Microsoft, and I hope I hope they got a great deal because they they really put out something special. But like it it, it looked like a game that wouldn't be hard, whereas Meat Boy looks like a game that would be hard. Yes, that's true. Yeah, if you watch a trailer, you you understand that from Super Meat Boy. Yeah, like you're jumping over saws and you look like you die all the time, and then like Cuphead, everything you see for Cuphead is like oh 1940s cartoon, awesome looking stuff. And you don't think. So I think people, they projected what they thought the game was going to be based on how it looked. And they weren't expecting it to be as hard as they were. And then typical weird entitled person syndrome, which happens on the internet all the time. They felt cheated somehow. Like some of them did. I mean, uh, and when I say some, it's the loudest people that Mm. felt cheated. Like most people I feel are just like, this is awesome. (laughs) But but there's no articles that are like, this is awesome, because articles that say this is awesome don't get clicks. Like, articles that say, we should have a skip boss button for Cuphead, or Cuphead's way too hard, or this or that. That gets people upset and gets people talking. And then that's that's clicks, and that's views, and that's ad revenue. and I mean, they have to make a leave-in. I get it. But, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I wish, uh, you know, people just didn't try to find things to shit on just enjoyed but that's me <laughs> i mean obviously as a journalist i'm not going to say that everyone just writes clickbait all the time but it, it... no no of course not and again that's the loudest yeah ones. that's the point it gets you shared know. the most and it gets talked about the most and it becomes a talking point yeah for sure um the, i think the thing for cuphead um which again i i don't know whether this did happen at the time but it, it is an argument that could be applied to super meat boy as well is there's an accessibility thing. I've seen I've seen a couple of people talking about this and that it's it's so hard that it's inaccessible to so many people. And mm. I thought that was interesting because their argument was, well, there should be an easy mode for, for more people to be able to play it, which is nice. Mm-hmm. That's fine. I don't feel that every game has to be for everyone. Great if a game does go out of its way to do that. Fantastic. The more people that play a game, the better. But I of don't course, feel yeah. that that every game is targeting a specific audience anyway. I don't I don't necessarily think that's always important. Yeah, like, that gets into weird territory. Like, well, you could spoil the design as well. You could totally wreck the level design by doing that. Yeah. Like, it's, you know, I like, I like movies with dogs in them. I think all movies should have dogs in them. Like, it doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. I don't know what it is. The... The armchair designers, I guess it is. Because it's like, there's a reason that the game is hard. And I don't know if that reason is because they wanted to make a hard game or they accidentally made a hard game. Like, who knows what the reason was, but at the end of the day, it's the thing that they made. So, like, if they want to put in a super easy mode or whatever so people can, like, experience it, like, make it more accessible to people, then... That's ultimately their decision. Like, if if they don't do it, I don't think they should be chastised for not doing it. Um, applaud it if they do, and nothing if they don't. Like, yeah, that's how I feel as well. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I doubt anybody would have applauded them for putting in something because it wouldn't have been newsworthy at that yeah. point. Like, nobody would have been, oh, Cuphead's hard, but you can put it on the super easy mode and enjoy everything. Like, that's not that's not an interesting thing to read, and that's not a controversial thing to read. So I don't think anybody would have, like, hoisted them up for that. I, I don't think that many people were pissed off about that anyway. No, I don't think so either, yeah. But I saw it come up. Um, yeah. Anyway, Cuphead's lovely. Let's go back to the games you've actually worked on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cup, Cuphead looks amazing. I haven't played it, but I've, I've certainly watched a lot of it. Yeah, it so. looks, I mean, it looks stunning. Um, back to Super Meat Boy. So the yeah. uh, original Flash game, Meat Boy, um, mm-hmm. but did you play it before speaking to Edmund? Because I have no idea how you two, how the, how Team Meat really even happened. I don't really know how that started. Yeah, that was, the way that happened was I was in the IGF for a game called Goo. Yes. Alongside World of Goo, which was super confusing to people. <laughs> um, but, but my game was bad. So, so that wasn't that confusing to other people. 
Um, my game was basically a tech demo. It was all multi-threaded liquid physics. Mm. Like before, that was a cool thing to do. I was I was on the forefront of that, um, but it didn't go anywhere. Uh, but I got into the IGF for that, and I was like, I wasn't really familiar with the IGF. I had known about it through the guy I was working with Goo on. But I, you know, I'm I'm actually a guy that doesn't really follow the indie scene. Like, okay. I don't really know what's coming out. I, I know a bunch of developers, but they're more like people that I've met in person and I'm friends sure. with. Like I don't I don't know what's coming out. I don't I don't know the drama. Like I don't I, I just never really followed it. And I knew of the IGF and I'm like, well I'll submit to this thing. And I got in and I start looking through it and I'm like, Oh, this is actually pretty neat. And like it was a big deal for me to get into it. Like I didn't get into it and like, oh cool. I was like you know, at once I entered I started researching it and I got more and more excited about it and like the day they were announcing the finals I was like a nervous wreck because I'm like oh god <laughs> uh, just just anything just just let me in and then I got in for they had a category called technical excellence and I got in for that which was like cream dream mm-hmm. for me because I'm just a tech guy so I'm like awesome I get in with that and I'm like looking through past winners and everything once I got in and I see that Gish won in 2005 and I look at who who made Gish because I was looking at who made everything, and I recognized Edmund's name because back in 2000, uh, that was around Newgrounds time, and he and I were both on Newgrounds, and we both shared links to each other's sites. Right. And so I I uh, email him, and I'm like, hey, I saw you were a winner on this, blah blah blah, and we started talking, and then eventually that turned into, hey, let's work on something together. So and then. We made a game called uh, Gray Matter, which was like an anti-shooter, and that was a little flash game on Newgrounds. And around that time, I think it was, yeah, it was around that time, he was also working on Meat Boy, the first Meat Boy, the, the flash game with John McKinty, and he's like, hey, we should bring this to WiiWare, and I'm like, cool, let's do that. <laughs> and, and that's, that's kind of, because he was talking to Nintendo at the time, and they were looking for a game to make, and uh, like I said, I was a crazy tech guy, so if you give me hardware for a thing, I can get something working pretty quick. So it just, yeah, it just sort of fell into place there. Right. Yeah. I don't think I had played it before I talked to him because we had been talking for a while, and I think it was just like he sent me a link to it. He's like, hey, play this. I'm like, all right, cool. And then I played through it. I'm like, oh, this is pretty awesome. So This is awesome, but I can make it better. Yeah. <laughs> We can we can do more. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, and I guess the scope just grew from there, really. I find that with a lot of things that I work on, like um, even to Forever, like Forever was going to be a much smaller game, and then when I started really working on it, like I started back on it this mm-hmm. year, um, I was just like, this is good. This can be much more than what it was going to be, which what it was going to be was just something small. It was a mobile game, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was basically just going to be. It was going to be on Steam too, but it was going to be something very small, like three chapters, like two or three levels in each chapter, just to like give the fans something that they wanted. Because for a long, long time after Meat Boy came out in 2010, mm-hmm. uh, people were like, "When is this coming to Android? When is this coming to iOS?" And I would always go, "Why?" Yeah. <laughs> like, this is a Twitch platformer game. It's not going to work on this. I'm not going to throw Sonic the Hedgehog controls on it because if you remember, Sonic the Hedgehog came out and it had buttons yep. on the touch screen, which doesn't work because that's not how our brains yep. work. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this. It's going to be terrible. And then it sort of dawned on me in like 2011. I was like, oh, they don't want Meat Boy. They want a game that plays like Meat Boy and feels like Meat Boy and is good like Meat Boy. They want that. I'm like, oh, well, I can make that. Like, I just can't do the, I can't do the first one on this, but I can, I can probably do something different. <laughs> so then I prototyped it, and then, you know, we we decided to work on it, and then it got kind of put on the back burner for a little bit, and then kind of picked back up on it this year. And yeah, I was actually sort of concerned because Mario Run came out like December of last yeah. year, and I figured that was that was the window closing. It was like, well, they've they've mastered the platformer on this thing. Why is anybody going to play Meat Boy when they could play Mario? And um, 
like Mario, I didn't play that much of Mario Run because I really couldn't get into it. But it didn't feel like Mario to me. Like it looked like Mario, but it didn't. There's a feel to Mario. Mario has a feel. Like Meat Boy has a feel. Yeah, I think they were trying too much to fit into the mobile market, and their pricing strategy messed them up as well. Yeah, the uh, yeah, because it was like ten bucks, which I was actually fine with. I was fine to be like, okay, it's eight. Oh yeah, buy outright, and then it's done. No in-app stuff, but most people did not gel with that. Yeah, because that's it's it's a it's a much different market. Like the iPhone people spend a thousand dollars on an iPhone, and they'll be like, Ugh, I have to spend two dollars on yeah, this exactly. App. Like it's it's a totally different marketplace, and I and I understand that, and it's it's terrifying because like you know forever is going to be on mobile and i have no idea how to oh price right it. i know how to make it but i don't know how to price it <laughs> so i have no idea how that's even going to work but i'm not relying on that for uh the thing that makes it worthwhile mm-hmm. because all the consoles and steam will be the thing that makes it worthwhile and then whatever happens on mobile will be like bonus yeah. money or whatever yeah like when when mario came out it looked like Mario, but it didn't feel like yeah, Mario. Yeah, I agree. And with Meat Boy, Meat Boy Forever still feels like yeah. Meat Boy. Even though it's it's not Meat Boy. It's not Super Meat Boy, but it feels it feels like it. Like you get the same feelings and emotions from it. So that little panic like subsided and I'm like, okay, well I'm gonna swing for the fences and just make this like a full, huge game, put it on all the consoles and you know, it's it's going to be the mm-hmm. sequel, and and then I'll then I'll do something after that. I, I mean, seeing as we've jumped onto it forever, I've I've played it at, at EGX. I missed you, which was a shame. Um, but but that's how this Sorry that's how that. this happened. So now everyone can hear it. Yeah. Well, hey, but uh, yeah, I played it at EGX. Played it on the Switch, and it, it oh, it's really hmm. good on the Switch. It's such a good console yeah. for it. That's you know, people say that a lot about the Switch and. Um, I counter that with I think the Switch is just a good console. Yeah. Like I don't think there's a game that's oh such a good fit for the Switch. I think it's like you know because I don't think there's any, been anybody that said the words oh I think that this game is such a good fit for Xbox yeah. because you know Xbox and PlayStation and Steam are basically all the same like experiences like graphic fidelity, frame rate, blah blah blah, and like. The Switch has all of that too, not to the same degree that Xbox and all those have, but it's a good console that makes sense. And the Xbox and the PlayStation are also good consoles that make sense. And it's been a while since we've had a Nintendo console that's fit that description. Yeah, sure. Like the the Wii was great, uh, but it was basically a Wii Sports machine. Uh, the Wii U was was great, but it was basically a Mario Kart 8 machine. Um, and then the Switch comes out, and it's Breath of the Wild machine, and a Mario Kart, and this, and that. And it's like, oh, finally, this is like a good console that it just feels it feels mm-hmm. good. So I don't think anybody's going to say, oh, this game just doesn't feel right on the Switch because it's just a console but the added awesome thing of the switch is the you can just take it anywhere which yeah. is great <laughs> it's like it's the thing that makes it different Absolutely. and and i i really love that about it yeah it, it, i mean it's i almost exclusively use my switch as a handheld device at the moment because i have long commutes mm-hmm. um so yeah it's just it's perfect for it to be on there yeah i i thoroughly enjoy the console yeah and indies are booming on it at the moment like there is some real yes. there's an indie gold rush in there right now and I would love to understand there really why is. but I don't entirely. I mean the library's expanding so it'll be interesting to see if that continues yeah. whilst the library's expanded. I think it I think it will because I think after years and years of Nintendo basically missing out because uh the first independent champions were PlayStation. Um they're the ones that did Everyday Shooter, Flow, all of those were before Xbox uh summer of arcade and then microsoft picked up on it and then they became the more successful champion of indies so like you know flow and everyday shooter did fine but they didn't do castle crashers yeah. fine and microsoft is the one that took it to the next level of like hey let's put a whole bunch of marketing dollars behind this mm. too and see what it does and they were like oh wow this actually does make money and then playstation countered and then they did more and the whole time, 
it was basically a struggle to get anything on the eShop. Like, they wouldn't promote anything on the eShop for, for, like, WiiWare, they weren't really promoting anything. eShop on the Wii U, they weren't. Uh, 3DS, they weren't. And then finally with the Switch, I think they finally caught up. And they're like, okay, well, this is, this is a market that we are letting slip through. Yeah. Why don't we start doing stuff? And um, Damon Baker at uh, Nintendo... I believe he's been instrumental in that. Like he's planning the the Nindies Night stuff, and you know, really, really getting the independent games out there in front of people. And uh, he's doing basically everything that Dan Edelman wanted to do when he used to work mm-hmm. there. <laughs> but um, but it, he was. It, I don't think Nintendo was ready for it at that time. And and Damon has picked it up and. Yeah, I, I think he's really, really doing a good job with it, and and it shows because everybody wants to put their game on Switch now, yeah. which they kind of had to beg people to put games on Wii U and on WiiWare back in the day, and now now they have the opposite, and I th- I think they're in a better place because they have a console that people want, which they have they haven't had that since the Wii because nobody nobody really knew what the Wii U was. No, yeah, it was a I worked in a game store when it came out, so. Yeah, pe- people just did, thought it was. Did people think it was an add-on? Yeah, parent parents yeah. Would, yeah. just thought it was a new version of the Wii. They didn't understand that it was a new console. They didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but now they they finally have something that's appealing, like that, that's appealing on the level of the 3DS, but it's actually a console that can have games that are on other current gen consoles. Yeah. And yeah, I'm I'm glad because it's I love Xbox and PlayStation, but they're kind of the same. Like they're they're both pushing 4K mm. and this and that and that's all fine and dandy, but it's nice to have it's nice to have Nintendo back because Nintendo's always been the weird innovators, like not exactly an underdog, but somebody yeah. that's like we're gonna do something different. It, I mean, it's <laughs> like they finally realized we're not Sony Microsoft. We're not even competing with them. We're something yes. different. Like we're, it's just for them. Yeah. Like whatever. Yeah. Let them compete. We'll do our thing. Yeah, and and I I think that's I think that's super good. I'm 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 very happy, very very happy with that. But yeah, anyway, Meat Boy, <laughs> back to Meat Boy. Shut up, Nintendo. Back to Meat head. Boy. <laughs> so yeah, you played it on the Switch. I uh, yeah, I genuinely enjoyed. I obviously haven't played that much of it because it was you know events. So you stay there for like fifteen twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. But I uh, played it. Really enjoyed it. Um, I haven't got to experience the the thing where where you replay levels and it gets harder. I haven't done yeah. that. that. Sounds really cool, but I haven't I haven't done that yet. Yeah, but yeah, I'm really genuinely looking forward to that. Um, is that getting a physical release? It might. Um, everybody seems to really want physical releases yeah. now, and um, I am the opposite. I want everything. Do you? It's, see, digital is more convenient, but for but for yes. it, which absolutely definitely just straight up is. But I am a physical guy because I care about preservation of games and stuff like that, and I just. Just Fair to enough, have something yeah. material in my hands just feels like I can keep this forever. If in 15 years I remember this game, I want to play again, I it's here, it's on my shelf, I have it. Yeah, you you don't have to be like, oh, well, they shut down the yeah. eShop 15 years ago when Amazon bought Nintendo. Like, you don't have to... <laughs> it's all through Prime Now games, yeah. and they don't sell it anymore. Yeah, you can have the, the actual physical thing. Yeah, I... Uh, a Meat Boy Physical Edition is, uh, it's not something I've, I've ruled out. I haven't really looked into it too much because we're still pretty far away, but I think it's a safe bet to say that uh, since the demand is pretty high, that it'll probably happen. So, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I just like having physical releases and stuff, really. Um, in fact, I have a physical release of Super Meat Boy on the PS4. Oh, yeah. How did that happen? I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that until uh, earlier this year. <laughs> and I think it's been out for like two years. Yeah, it's years. been out for a little while now. Yeah, that it was, it was yeah. just so late, and it was just, it's just a bit weird, really. Yeah, uh, I re- so it happened during a time when I was like super busy with other life things. So when I saw the physical release... I like had this like almost movie esque flashback of signing the papers to actually do that, and like and it was a memory that I hadn't thought of since I did that, and I was like, oh yeah, I did do that, <laughs> and then I contacted the manufacturer and I'm like, hey, I never got any of these, can I have some? And they're like, yeah, sure. Oh, what? So, you didn't even get one? No, I didn't even get one. It was like I was surprised because people were like, oh man, just I, I saw it in a tweet or something, 
And they're like, oh man, I, I'm so glad that games released on physical. It was like Meat Boy on PS4. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> but yeah, then I got some sent to me. And Good. Yeah, now, now they're sitting in a box. Is that your first physical release? Is that your first thing you've had? A- no, actually, there was, um, let's see, there was Meat Boy on PC that was released by two different publishers here in the States. Oh, okay. The first one screwed, screwed us out of money. Oh. And the second one did okay. And then uh, Head Up Games has done... They're actually the ones that did the uh, the PS4 release also, but they did a PC one. There was a Russian release of Super Meat Boy that had a crazy... Uh, we did an art contest for the cover, and it's like... It's Meat Boy with like a Russian hat on... <laughs> in, in the middle of like Red Square. <laughs> oh, it looks so awesome! It's my absolute favorite one. That's um, great. I, I need that. Yeah, we did that. But, yeah, there was a Ultra Ultra something edition in the UK that was released that had a T-shirt packaged in with oh. it. It was like a big box. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we had quite a few, but that was actually the first console that it was physical on. Was the was the PS4? That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty neat. We might do we might do physical of Meat Boy on Switch, like the like Super Meat Boy, because that one's coming out hopefully soon. Um, we might do a physical of that because, like, more than any other console, people want Switch physical editions. Yeah. Like, and uh, Tyrone from uh, Nicholas has like figured all that shit out. Oh yeah, he's he's running with that with Switch physical releases. I I talk to him all the time and. He's, like, telling me all the stuff that he's, like, gone through to figure out and all this stuff. And I'm like, damn, dude. <laughs> like, you, 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 have, you have done what most people think is the impossible because, like, you, it's, it's everywhere. Like, I go into Best Buy here and it's just sitting there on the shelf next to Breath of the Wild. Like, Isaac was and I think, uh, I don't know if I saw a cave story, but I saw, like, another game that he put out. Like, and I'm just like, holy crap, Tyrone. Yeah. Like, that's impressive. <laughs> I, I've been importing them all. Uh, yeah, I love I love that Nicholas are doing that. It's great stuff. He does them uh, special. Like the uh, the Cave Story one has random keychains in it, yeah. which I, I think is just a, a just an amazing idea. And yeah, he's he's really made physical editions special mm. again. And like yeah, I, he's worked his ass off for that too. I, I know from talking to him, and I'm I'm glad it's paying off. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't get the special stuff because I have to import them, and I think there's like GameStop exclusive all the extra bits, so I don't get I don't get. Those, oh but, yeah, but importing isn't that difficult really because it's up on Amazon, so it's it's easy. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people in Europe complaining that it's not here yet. I'm like it costs it will cost you the same. <laughs> it will literally cost you. It will literally <laughs> yeah, right. Cost you the same to go on Amazon.com and just import it. Yeah, and just just pop one over too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's that. Be, I didn't know that was that might be possible. That's really cool. Yeah. Last thing we'll sort of cover. We'll pop off so that you can take those headphones off of your head. Sounds good. Yeah, my ears. Are <laughs> um, so indie game the movie. Mm-hmm. How did that even happen? So that was. Um, God, let me even think because it seems like a million years ago, but it was only seven years ago. The way that happened was, um, do you know who Alec Holoka is? Uh, he made Night in the Woods. Yeah. Yeah. So the the guy the guy that made Night in the Woods, his name's Alec Holoka, and uh, there was a film crew filming him for something, and uh, they asked him like, "What other indies?" Blah blah blah, and he told them about uh, me and Edmund working on Meat Boy. And they, they like, Skyped us and talked to us, and they decided to uh, kind of film our development just as, as we went through. They filmed a bunch of others. Um, like, they filmed Fez. They filmed uh, John Blow was like, was, like, after his game came out and everything. But, um, yeah, they just sort of started following us around, and uh, they, they found our story intriguing, so we became kind of one of the three developers that was featured in the movie. Um, they filmed a whole bunch, but they kind of cut it down because it made better narrative sense because they had, they had so much footage of us and our, our story sort of progressed through right. the part of development that is the most interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, like it, it kind of happens, and at the time... 
had no idea it was even going to be like a thing. Right. Like, because we didn't see any footage of it until 2011, uh, almost a year after the game came oh, out. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, uh, we saw like little bits of footage here and there, but it was always like a thing in the back of the mind. Like, oh, okay. And then they showed us like the, the first like complete cut of the movie in 2011. And we're both like, holy shit, this is actually like a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, you know, it's, it's a documentary, but they, you know, James and Lee Sam, the, the two people that made it, uh, they're so good at editing and piecing together story that it's, it's above and beyond. Like there's been a lot of other video game documentaries that have come out after it. But you kind of don't hear of those because they don't present the stories in the same way that James and Lee Sand did. And it speaks to their experience with film and, like, their backgrounds and everything. Like, they they totally knocked it out of the park. Absolutely. Uh, with how they put the movie together. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I don't like the first thing I say in the movie because uh, I was very, very stressed out at that time. <laughs> well, of course you were. But, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean... Yeah, kind of, kind of a crazy thing to be a part of, like this movie that gets into Sundance and then is on Netflix, yeah. and then I, I swear millions of people have seen it uh, because it's, I mean, because of Netflix, basically. Like, yeah, and even non gamers. My my partner is does not play video games, um, but he's seen it and loved it. He actually really, really enjoyed yeah. the film. Like, it just is a good film. It's yeah, it's it's just a, a good film, and a, like it's a good film that has good characters and good storylines in it. Like, it's it's just. It's just a good movie. Um, my only complaint is I don't think the name is that great. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what else you would call it. In indie game, the movie. They're, they're really... they're really Following the indie yeah. guys. Making the games, the, the movie. Yeah, making the games, the movie. Yeah, no, they they truly know what they're doing. I, I hope they do something uh, new here pretty soon. Like I, I want to see another film by them. Because they, they really made something special. I mean, of course I can say that because I was in it. But um, people wouldn't say it's special and has affected them if it wasn't. Like, I, I get that all the time. I go, when I'm at PAX, without fail, I will be recognized several, several times a day. Like, not, not at the booth. Like, just walking around. <laughs> like, people recognize my face and be like, oh. And, and the really funny thing that's common to about 95% of people that approach me, they're like... Yeah, I saw you in that uh, that indie game movie, and it's like they can't remember the title, but they do remember the title because they just yeah. said it. As I mean, you were an indie game movie, yeah, but yeah. No, it, I get a lot of a lot of people that say like, "Oh, it inspired," and of course, my response is always like, "Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, it inspired you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's inspired you." Or or the response is, "I'm glad you enjoyed watching me suffer." I'm glad that was that was for your entertainment. Do you know what it is? It's that <laughs> most people do not have any idea of what the development process is like. Because obviously I, I, I don't because I haven't done it, but I have somewhat more than most people, I'd say, because it's my work. That's what I write about. Yeah. But I guess a lot of people watching that, that was really the first time they fully understood. For for, the, for a lot of them, is yeah, why, it... like, this is a genuine struggle. Like, this is, it is dramatic. <laughs> this is why it works as a movie. Yes, exactly. Like they, it, it lifts the veil because you know when you when you think about video games and especially at the time when that movie came out, um, that was, you know, stuff was ramping up for independent developers and everything. But still, the huge majority of people think video games are this crazy black box of uh, developers that make stuff behind closed doors. Like you have you have no idea. Like I remember growing up and thinking. I want to work at Nintendo, but having no idea what I wanted to do at Nintendo, I just wanted to make mm. a game. I figured, well, you got to go to Nintendo to make a game, and that was that was how you did it, you know. Um, yeah, like it, it's really lifted the veil, and it was like, hey, you know, this is this is people struggling to do something that they want. Like it's not it's not this cynical, hey, let's let's just put out a game and you shoot people. Like it's it's that sometimes, but. You know, more often than not, there's like actual stories and there's people. It's it's you know, it's art. Yeah. It's it's people working towards a goal, and uh, it's hard to see with the final product because you just see you just play a video game, you don't really think anything of it. You know? But 
But yeah, the movie the movie really lifted that for a lot of people and made made a lot of people go, "Oh, this is something I could do," uh, which is pretty cool. Like, it's I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of awesome to have people come up to you and say, "Hey, uh, I saw you in in that indie game movie and it really inspired me." Like, it's it's always like, "Wow, that's that's kind of crazy." <laughs> You know, people got to see that developers are passionate, and they're passionate people. And you got, they got to see how the sausage was made, and they didn't gross them out. It didn't gross everybody out. Gross some Although people. sausage, sausage the movie that that we need that sausage factory the movie. Oh god, that, mwah, beautiful. I want to see. I want to see a sausage maker guy cry after uh, he releases his artisan sausage to the world. I've been fucked over by Microsoft. Yeah, what the what the fuck? It's not out in the Whole Foods. <laughs> it was supposed to be on display. Oh, oh dear. Brilliant. Jeez. Right. So going back to Super Meat Ball Forever, it's out soon, ish. When is it out? Yeah, uh, summer of next year. Are you simultaneously releasing that even for mobile? Is mobile out at the same time as consoles as well? <laughs> the plan right now, because there there's an important thing about releasing something on mobile. And there's a stigma with mobile games. So if I were to take and release the game on iOS first, uh, people would see it as a mobile game that got ported to console. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, uh, but it's something I can't have. Because the game is... It's, it has more content than Super Meat Boy. It's a bigger game than Super Meat Boy. And I need people... I need the exact opposite... Uh, to be said about the game. So I need it to be out on consoles first, and then when I take it to mobile, I need people to see it as, oh, they took this console game, they took Meat Boy Forever, and they put it on mobile phone. It's not like the opposite would be, oh, they took the Meat Boy mobile game, and they put it on console. Like, even though it would be the exact same yeah, game, absolutely. the perception would be, oh, they put the cheap thing on the console as a yeah. cash-in. And it's like, no, that's not, like, this is giant huge sequel with chapters and bosses and all this stuff like this is this is a full price game this isn't a uh let's throw some ads on yeah. it and hope it makes money game which again i have no idea how much charge for it on mobile it'll probably flop on mobile honestly it'll probably totally flop on mobile because uh, there's there's no way i can be like uh here it is for a dollar yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that would like cheapen it on every other console, but like then to put it up on iOS for like you know ten, fifteen dollars or whatever it's going to be, it's just not going to do well on that because it's not the market. And there, there are people that are smarter than me at this that I'm going to consult with and see what they yeah. say because uh, I have no idea. I know how to make a successful game on consoles and PC, mobile. I have no idea. I can't even think of any game that has done that either, really. Not, not to my recollection. A yeah. game that's come out on consoles and mobile and is base, and is the same game across all platforms. And yeah, like I know Nicholas put uh, Rebirth on iOS, but I I don't think it's like it translated over. Like I uh, uh, meaning like I don't think people saw. Oh, Isaac's on iOS. Let me get that because I think it's like fifteen bucks on iOS, and that's just something people don't they don't pay that money for that on there. Like, that, that marketplace doesn't support a large price point unless you are Minecraft. Yeah. And there's only one Minecraft, so... But yeah, so it'll be consoles and PC first, and then shortly after, it'll be mobile. Um, it probably won't release on all consoles at the same time, because uh, that might kill me. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll probably be a little bit staggered, but not months in between i'm i'm thinking like month weeks in between of of console release kind of thing so cool but the same window so yeah like you know it, it'll be like the summer of meat boy basically so and you would definitely should call it that <laughs> oh yeah i'm gonna i'll 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 buy a super bowl ad <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Um, so I'm dead looking forward to that. Seriously, genuinely am. Um, and I really hope we also get Super Tofu Boy forever, because otherwise, what's the point, right? Oh, yeah. You gotta throw him back in there. <laughs> but yeah, I guess we'll leave it at that. It has been absolutely wonderful speaking to you. Yeah, this has been good fun. Yeah, especially the sausage part. That's like highlight number one. 
Yeah. Talk about Sausage Factories. <laughs> That's what I came here for. S- sausage Factory, the movie. I'm going to make sure that happens one way or another. Yeah, well, get some dramatic music and shoot some footage of, of rain falling. <laughs> In your introductory yeah. shots, and yeah, you'll be in Sundance also. Oh, great! Well, that's what I want. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. I, Sundance and Netflix cannot wait. Yeah, Sundance and Netflix. You'll be living totally the dream. Fine. Um, it's been great speaking to you. People will listen and they'll say yes, that was a podcast. So that's good. <laughs> they will say yes, that was a podcast. Yeah, yeah. I like. That's that. why I want everyone to comment. Actually, yes, that was a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Listen, uh, in two weeks' time, we're coming out every other Wednesday now because having a schedule helps, basically. Releasing it whenever you want didn't work. So every other Wednesday now. Um, thank you. Nice. Here's my dirty little plug section. If you did enjoy this podcast, I did. It's wonderful, if I do say so myself. And if you did enjoy past ones, like the Grant Kirkhope episode, then please consider pledging on Patreon. Uh, it's just patreon.com slash toadsanime, I think. One of the rewards there is that you can choose a topic that might get spoken about briefly during an episode. There's also some other bits and bobs there as well, and I would super, 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 super appreciate anything whatsoever, even though obviously you don't have to, I don't care. If you don't, absolutely fine. Future episodes, we have some really cool guests planned. This is going to be bi-weekly, as I said, every other Wednesday, so make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to this. Thank you all. <laughs>